introduce our guest speaker. You already you already quizzed us, and we made fools ourselves. But... <laughs> you wouldn't be the first. Don't... Okay, okay. <laughs> and uh, so it's kind of we'll have people coming on in, but we'll uh, we're gonna just gonna continue on here. Um, so Randy Oliver is actually uh, a biologist. He does a lot of research in different areas. Um, he also has um, a talk that he's giving, going to give us in four different uh, areas that he's been looking at. And I'm just going to just stop it right there because this guy is really interesting and he's a good speaker and he has a lot to give us. So, uh, Randy, I'm going to turn it over to you right now. Great. So, Ken, what I'll ask you to do, can you watch the chats? And if you see if there's a question worthwhile coming in to answer at that point, just, uh, just hold your hand up and I'll, uh, I'll ask you to read the question, okay? Okay, sounds good. So one of the things that, that I do, um, I focus on applied research ra ra rather than basic research. Um, and what I see is much of the scientific uh, research community um, is more interested in basic, basic research, not research that beekeepers can directly uh, utilize in their management of, of their hives. So if, if I see an area where I get a lot of questions from other beekeepers and I'm not seeing good research published uh, on that, I'll often step in and, and run a uh, experiment field trials uh, myself. <clears throat> so these are uh, uh, four different uh, field trials that I ran in 2020. I was fairly ambitious. Um, one is a comparative uh, uh, trial of the, of the pollen subs. Um, one is a test of the probiotics. A lot of beekeepers ask me questions about probiotics. Uh, one is on varroa control during the summer, during our hot weather and uh, when we still have honey on, how you manage varroa during that time period. And then the last one as a part of this is an update on the extended release oxalic acid that I'm trying to get approved by the uh, EPA. So out in California, um, we, we have very dry summers. It's not at all usual to get our last rain in May and not see any rain until October. So uh, five, six months without a single drop of rain is, is, is not unusual. So it's very dry. As you can imagine, um, late summer and fall, we often have very little pollen flow. You guys out there are are blessed with the golden rods and the asters uh, to get your hives for, um, for winter. We don't, we don't have that blessing out here in, in California. <clears throat> so many of us uh, move our bees out of, out of state to uh, get them to go into winter in good shape and then move them back to California for almond pollination. And I did that for 25 years. And then uh, found out about uh, feeding pollen sub instead. And, uh, instead of spending the money uh, driving, leave your colonies at home and instead you spend the money on pollen sub and um, pollen subs have improved quite a bit. And in 2013, I made a uh, comparative trial of uh, several that were on the market and found that some were uh, dang near as good as natural pollen. But there's two new ones on the market now and I was approached by a manufacturer to uh, run a, a trial, uh, very <laughs> offered me a lot of money to do it. And I said, you know what? I think I'd rather have my, uh, my donors uh, run, uh, uh, pay for this, beekeepers themselves, and then I won't have any, uh, no, no, nobody would question whether I was biased or not on this trial. So um, <clears throat> what we do is uh, we have fed this uh, patty right here, the bulk soft. Uh, in our operation, we, we prefer not to have our patties uh, uh, flattened out and uh, with paper on either side. I like to feed um, uh, two and a half to uh, three and a half pounds at a time out of feeding. We don't have a uh, small high beetle to I any extent. And we can, uh, in the middle of the cluster, then we, uh, we get this in 50 pound boxes and then chunk it up with a spade in the, in the field and put the chunks right inside the hives. <clears throat> so this is a used for a number of years. Um, then uh, there's the uh, global patties. Um, and if my voice starts to break up, Ken, let me know, and I will um, turn my video off, and that'll give me more uh, bandwidth, okay? Global was a Canadian uh, con company. Um, they have a, uh, I don't know if they moved to Montana, but they uh, are selling uh, uh, patties out of Montana. And I asked them uh, uh, if I, they'd like me to test their premium patty, which uh, contains a natural pollen in addition to other ingredients. So they sent that one along. Then Dayton has a new one. Uh, uh, AP23, artificial pollen uh, 23. Um, that's uh, their flagship uh, product. And then uh, Dr. Gordon Wardell, when he worked for the USDA, developed Mega Bee, and his son now uh, sells this patty. And the Man Lake's flagship product is Ultra Bee, which is a very simple formulation to the bulk soft, a little bit different. And uh, man, I know that Man Lake is, is often tweaking uh, their formulas here, and uh, they're talking to me now about 
looking at these results. And then uh, um, th there was a healthy bee, and uh, this is a, a spirulina uh, algae, blue green algae patty. Um, Dr. Vince Rosigliano also um, did some research on uh, blue green algae uh, last year, and it looks very uh, promising. This is the only patty that also has a high level of essential oils, essentially thyme oil in it um, for whatever reason. Um, and, but I think that may have affected uh, the performance to this one. And then uh, some beekeepers who did help uh, to fund this uh, research were a group of commercial beekeepers down in uh, the Bakersfield area of California. And they have uh, been making a homebrew of their own for a number of years uh, based on a, a recipe from a, uh, a PhD in nutrition out of Mexico. And uh, so this is the homebrew. Uh, so they were curious, homebrew formulation would compare to the uh, off the shelf uh, patties. And then the last one it, were patties made of sugar alone, uh, like a sugar font that uh, was um, calculated to have the same amount of sugar on the average as these patties had with nothing else, no protein or oils in them at all, just the just, yeah, same amount of energy uh, or sugar energy as the other ones. Now, as you can imagine, we did this trial um, with 18 hives, eight types. So there's eight types, that's 144 hives in this trial. We did it in three different yards. And I'm really glad we did replicate it in three different yards because we got slightly different in those yards. And when you're running a trial like this, it's really tough uh, to avoid confusion and maybe feed the wrong patty one time. So what we did is uh, take all our patties out, count them, put them in these tubs with uh, color marks with uh, tape. And then these uh, tape, so all we, we didn't pay attention to the names. We just talked about red or green or white uh, patty. And then on the number of each hive, we would put these uh, colored tapes. So we just went by the colors and matched them. So when we, when we would feed at a yard, <coughs> we would um, lay all the patties out on top of the hives first to make sure all the count came out right. And everything was uh, double checked. And then we would feed each time. And we did, we did multiple feedings uh, from uh, July until, uh, until just recently uh, in January. So we, um, this is a typical yard. Here's my two sons, Eric and Ian, uh, with the hives uh, scattered out. So we uh, graded all the hives uh, in uh, late July for uh, colony strength, and then did a randomized block design, which means that we, we took the eight strongest hives in the yard and, and then randomly assigned the eight different pollen subs to those. And they go to the next eight strongest and then randomly assign the pollen subs to them. That way we knew that we had uh, the pollen subs equally fed to colonies across the strength range at the beginning. And uh, for the first part, we fed them through October. Uh, we took a brief break in November and then started them back up in December uh, with feed. And uh, we would feed whenever the, uh, the first patties were nearly all consumed. Oh, I didn't make this clear. Let me go back here. <clears throat> I told you the global had natural pollen in it and the homebrew has natural pollen in it. None of the others had any natural pollen in them at all. When you have natural pollen in the patty, so far in my testing, those are normally the ones that are consumed the most quickly by the bees, that, uh, that, that odor of the natural pollen. <clears throat> so we fed ad libitum, which means once the hives getting those natural pollen patties um, uh, had consumed uh, the patties, uh, we would feed everybody again and we'd remove any uneaten patty and, and weigh it uh, coming out of the hive. So we kept track of how much patty every hive actually consumed. <clears throat> then we were really surprised that the colonies didn't grow well. Now we, we, we fed hives and for many years and, and we intentionally chose three yards where we knew the colonies would just go nosedive if we didn't feed them pollen subs. So they were fed pollen sub and sugar syrup continually all through that time period. And in our experience, if we start that by the 1st of September, colonies grow up big and strong for the almonds. That's how we make our money. We couldn't get them to grow to any extent uh, this year. I wondered why. So I looked at the data from a local weather station and the solid lines are the 2020, this last summer's uh, uh, measurements. This would be the, your temperature high each day. And this would be your humidity low each day. And we compare previous year. And this during this feeding period, normally these temperatures are much lower Okay, like in the 70s, and the bees build up very quickly. What happened this year is, I mean, this is late se uh, September and October, and look at, we're hitting over 100 degrees uh, here, very hot temperatures. So 
these temperatures up here are, are near the limit of thermal stress for Apis mellifera, for uh, Italian bees, where the colonies just shut down and, and do nothing. And then we also had these, um, <clears throat> on the humidities, we had these uh, uh, low, um, uh, this is our 2020, our, see how much lower our humidities were than they were back in the previous year. So when we had these, these cool temperatures and high humidities in the previous year allowed these colonies to grow, then this year uh, they just couldn't uh, do it. <clears throat> and the point is- They don't like it dry. They don't like it dry and hot. That's, it's tough for them. Um, when I'm out in the field these days, <laughs> I, I remember saying to my sons, I said, Hey, am I just getting old, guys, or is it just hotter than it used to be? And this is recently published by NOAA. This is the average uh, uh, temperature for, let me see what it says. This is for June through August um, from 1895 to 2020. The blue regression line is my lifetime right there. So the answer to the question of, is it getting hotter, is yes. <laughs> it's getting hotter in, uh, in California. And we are really noticing it, especially on these really high uh, heat years here. And the bees are noticing it too. <clears throat> the other thing is, these are, this is winter temperatures over the same time period. And you see the winters, not quite as extreme as the, te as the high temperatures in the summer, but they're also getting warmer, which means that varroa is becoming more and more of a problem as we, when, on these really warm winters here, varroa never shuts down. So we have a, a much harder time with varroa control when we have these, uh, very, very warm winters. When you have a cold winter like this, we get a brood break and you don't have so much problem with varroa. You guys are lucky out there with your cold brood breaks because it makes varroa management much easier than it does for us out here in California. <clears throat> then I analyzed all the pollen subs for protein, lipids, and, uh, and looked for a correlation between the uh, nutrient content and the change in colony strength. And as you can see, there was no correlation with lipids a negative with sugar, but very strong correlation with uh, protein in the, uh, in the patties. The other thing we found is that um, natural pollen was not a necessary uh, component for good performance of these uh, patties. <clears throat> when I look at the, uh, the different uh, patties here for protein uh, content. The stuff I use. The highest uh, protein content is the Ultra B, about 22% uh, protein. The lowest was the AP23. Um, and yet uh, this one performed very well uh, up there with the other ones. So it's not just the uh, protein content. So I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. It's, it's more than just protein. The manufacturers tend to go by uh, research by uh, De Groot, um, who uh, uh, figured out acid uh, requirements for honeybees. This is not cutting edge research. It was published in 1953 and unlike every other industry where they have done a ton of research since the 50s learning about amino acid requirements of, of livestock. Um, no one's followed up on that. And this is something I've been very much looking into for a number of years and uh, recently reanalyzed uh, De Groot's. Uh, his study is uh, 80 pages of print and, and graphs before you get to the citations. And I have <laughs> lived in the growth research, incredible research, but it's, it's research. So even though looking at these patties where the growth um, recommendation of the ratio of these amino acids is the black columns, and it looks like um, all the other ones are above uh, his recommendation, I feel that the manufacturers um, have not interpreted his work uh, uh, correctly. So then what I did is when, uh, when we graded the colonies to make it easy, I uh, normalized them to the strength change in the sh uh, sugar control hive, set that as zero, and then to see how much change there was of the other ones so I could rank them. So in this case, the purples outperformed, um, uh, the average was uh, one point times uh, the gain compared to uh, zero down here. Um, I'm, 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 I'm still uh, uh, working on analyzing panel uh, grading, so I, I'm not gonna tell you the results right now. But what I will do is I was trying to figure out why some of the perform better. And I'm very curious if I could predict their performance from their uh, analyses, their, their lab analyses. And I just, I've spent oh, dozens and dozens of dozens of hours going over this until I finally looking carefully at DeGroat study said, oh, I should look at them this way. And I blocked the, the key thing right here because I'm gonna publish this soon. 
And this is the correlation between the uh, performance, how strong they were from the strong 100% down to the weakest, and the correlation of that with the sum of the amino acid deficiencies that I that I, is a, a straightforward calculation that I made for you. You can see it's got an R squared value of 0.81. That's an incredibly high correlation coefficient. And if you look at the data, it looks like it's very much predictive and it falls right in line with De Groot's research. So I've already written to all the manufacturers and told them I've created a calculator. I'm gonna, I'm gonna publish as a freebie for everybody to use. That anybody can use to um, uh, show you how to mix your different ingredients in your pollen subs to try to obtain the perfect immune so that you could be up here in the top tier rather than being down here in the in the bottom tier. So I've already done all the field work, <clears throat> but at the beginning and the end of the trial, we also uh, I took samples of bees from every hive and froze them on dry ice and shipped them to uh, Versigliano at the USDA. He's already done the analysis for the uh, head weights and the thorax weights of the bees, and that matches my performance uh, uh, rankings of them, and. Uh, He's going to do uh, next-gen sequencing of the gut microbiomes to see uh, how different polysubs affect the gut microbiomes in these bees, to see if there was a, a problem with the essential oils uh, in the uh, healthy bee. Then he's doing other uh, dives into molecular biology as he's um, analyzing this to see what happens. So there'll be a lot more results that he'll publish as a uh, scientific peer-reviewed uh, paper. <clears throat> Any questions on the polysubs? Is your answer to that study going to be published next month? Not next month, but um, uh, I've already uh, submitted my next two articles to ABJ. Um, so it'll probably um, follow that one. So it'll probably be a couple of months uh, still. 